It's about creating conversation. Because when we create conversation, you create conversation. Arrow.net, A-R-R-O-E.net. We are unplugged and totally uncut with Rick Prado. Doing well. Uh, thank you for having me on. Absolutely. I cannot imagine where your heart and your mind is right now in, in the way that the, the world is changing so quickly. I was, I was with a fighter pilot over the weekend, and he says he's reaching out and talking with people in Ukraine because people need to stay motivated. Dude, you, you are CIA, and it's in your blood forever. Yeah, you know, I can't say that I am shocked or surprised by, by what's going on. Uh, I, I've seen it in, in my life from, from childhood to my professional career. Um, yes, uh, the, the, uh, the Ukraine situation is, is he- you know, leading the headlines um, now. But that's been something that has been under siege for several years now. Mm-hmm. And the United States has been supporting the Ukraine in, in training and supplies for, for a very long time. So to say that we, we were surprised by, uh, by them taking over, the Russians taking over a piece of, of uh, Ukraine, hopefully just a piece, um, it's no surprise to, to the professionals at all. We know that that's the modus operandi of the communists. That's what they have always done. And that's what they will continue to do if we do not have a posture and a capability that dissuades them from implementing their expansionism. The name of the book that you're releasing is called Black Ops. I, what I love about this, it reminds me so much of an inside sleeve of an album because those of us who like, you know, stuff like this, I mean, you're, you're giving us a view and it, it does inspire and it also empowers, but it also informs. Yeah, I mean, and that was the main goal of, of, of the book, to, to show the American people what a great resource they have um, the fact that we are a moral, patriotic culture that puts their lives on the line for, for God and country, and for the most part, a very ungrateful mistress because we can't tell anybody what we do or where our successes are. Uh, my book had to go through six months of approval through the agency, and I was extremely pleasantly surprised of how much they allowed me to, to reveal. But these were things that no longer can compromise anybody or, or any operation. Well, you're a good CIA agent because you must have looked at my notes before we even talked today because it's right there. It says, uh, lifting the veil on secrecy. How did you get it by the government? I mean, I mean seriously, I mean, I, I talk with a lot of men and women who have served this nation, and they, they, they'll sit there and talk about it. And most of them say that they, they write these, these books that really didn't happen, but it's still based on the experience. Will you grow in that direction, too, and give us a little bit of James Bond action seen through basically your imagination? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I have been approached by a couple of uh, co-writers um, that, that are friends of mine. And uh, they've asked me to say, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you didn't get to talk about. Would you be willing to uh, to put that in, you know, change the country, change the time, change the target, and have uh, the, some additional sexy stories? It's a possibility. But, you know, um, Right now, my, my, my big fight is this book, uh, getting it out there and getting the American people to understand that the agency is something that they should appreciate. You know, so for the most part, the agency is seen as that pit bull that you keep in the backyard with a chain that you never pet, but you you feed him and you expect him to take care of your home. Um, and, that, and that's not right. And we're not like that. We're, we're made of, of great people. We have sacrificed 173 lives in, 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 the, in, the, in the preservation of our country, mm. the, the CIA has. And a third of those numbers are post 9-11, so it's all t- terrorism related kind of stuff. Is, is there a difference between the CIA and the KGB? Absolutely, absolutely. There, there's a tons of difference. First of all, we have different ideologies. Mm-hmm. You know, we are a democratic capitalist country. Uh, KGB is a authoritarian, uh, restrictive uh, mindset, and it's a lot easier for them to conduct operations and to control their 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 masses because they have control over everything. They also don't have the oversight or the scruples that we are under. You know, we we the United States, and this is the price of democracy, and I'm not knocking it, but we in the United States have four year plans. That's all we can afford to have. Because different administrations, if they come in, are going to have very different optics on what that big plan was. Where Russia and China, though, they have that problem. They don't have a Congress to deal with, and they can have a 50-year plan and tweak it as they go. But the bottom line for communism is 
world control, expansionism, oppression, and control. That's all it is. I, I studied martial arts with a gentleman that tried his darndest to get into the FBI. He, he didn't make it. How did you get into the CIA? I mean, that, that's like top dog. Well, you know, I I, uh, I started in the martial arts when I was 15, so maybe that, no, that wasn't it. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the real story here is I, I honestly, I'm, I'm a spiritual guy. I believe that the, the, the God puts us, uh, it shows us our path, and if we have the courage to pay the price of admission, you'll live a wonderful life, which I am so grateful for, both to my God and to my country. But it, it, it is what drives us. My, my thing started in, in, in Cuba as a, as a young kid, seeing firsthand what what, uh, what guerrilla warfare was mm-hmm. like, what fights were, were like, where how communism takes over and, and, and immediately lifts that mask of that, that hides the real monster. And, you know, every, every private business being confiscated, homes taken away. Um, I literally saw people hanging from trees with signs around mm-hmm. their necks that said contra revolutionaries. And then, you know, my mom and dad put me on a plane to come to the United States by myself. I'm an only child because they could not get out, but they could not afford to have, they would, they would, they would not allow his son to grow up in that kind of, uh, of a regime. And, you know, that courage is what I draw out of for my own courage, because I will tell you, I don't know that I would have the fortitude that my parents had to put my only child at age 10 on an airplane to a country they've never been and may never be able to even visit. It's it's almost like, Rick, that they planted a seed for the future. It's almost like they heard something first from God and then they said, okay, you know, like Moses, they set Moses free. They found him in the water. <laughs> Thank you. That's a hell of a comparison. I appreciate that. But but yes, I mean, I, I, I honestly, uh, people say, well, you know, you made it to the senior ranks of CIA. Um, how, how did you plan your career? I never planned my career. I always followed my heart. And I always wanted to do damage to the bad guys. You know, the same way that the Russians ethos is that of the Viking and the Cossacks. That's why Putin is so popular in, in, in his country. You know, the ethos of the Americans, I've always seen it as the cowboy with a white hat. Yeah. And, and and that's what we should strive for, because you still have the courage, you still go in harm's way, you still take a life if necessary, but what the reason why you're doing it is why it's important. Violence for violence sake, or for personal gain, is immoral. But going in harm's way for a higher cause, uh, to me, is, is, is good karma and, and, and a gateway to heaven. Let, let, let's talk about that higher cause in the way that so many people, we're, to me, I believe we're, we're called every day. I, and the thing is, are, are you going to pick up the phone? And, and because we got, God plants things inside of you every single day. When you heard that moment, I know that in my own heart, it was like, okay, I never question it. When you feel something, you go for it. And, and you, you had to have that trust and that faith and, and that belief in, in God that he's going to protect me. And if he wants me home, I'm okay to go home today. It is. And, and, you know, you, you hit on something that's very important. Not everybody has to be a GI Joe or, a, or a CIA operations officer to contribute to this country. Um, the word is service. Yeah. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we made in this country, and unfortunately, I believe it was under Reagan, was doing away with mandatory service. Mm-hmm. And I, it doesn't have to be even military. It could be something as simple as, you know, three months with, with DIAA somewhere, I mean, with uh, the, the, um, the, the Humane Societies or one of these NGOs. Um, but even in the military and in, in government, in, mil- in the military, there's no job that doesn't exist in, there's no job in the private sector that doesn't exist in the military except for investment banking, maybe. Mm-hmm. So if you want to be a lawyer, doctor, Indian chief, firefighter, uh, G.I. Joe, in the future, the military is an option. But the bottom line is service. Only 2% of the American population serves in the military. Let's say that there's another 8% out there that serves in information, um, in law enforcement, uh, education, mm-hmm. those are those are all people that are contributing. Um, but business for business sake only, um, we, we need to do a little better than that. Our country has to realize 
the price that a lot of people have paid for us to enjoy what we have. We have it better than any other country in the world. You, you've got, as, as a CIA agent, as well as a leader in the community, you've got to be really nervous right now with the way that we're, te- we're teaching or even, even uh, working with this educational system because more teachers have walked away from their positions. The future of tomorrow and this nation really, it, w- what do we have here waiting for us? Yeah, that, that, that hits, hits home for a lot of reasons. One, uh, my daughter runs two charter schools, uh, and she is very much caught after my cloth. I mean, she's a very conservative Christian uh, woman, and uh, it, it's appalling the, uh, the renovation of, of history. Again, there is no country out there that has not committed mistakes in their past, but for somehow, those never resonate. It's always the mistakes that were made in the U.S., that continue to live on and live on generation after generation, even by people that were not directly affected. But look at communism. Look at communism in China, Mm -hmm. in Russia, in in Latin America like Venezuela. Venezuela is a perfect example of a country that was a democracy and a thriving capitalist country with some of the best oil in the world and definitely in, in this hemisphere. And you can, it's cheaper to wipe yourself with the currency than to buy toilet paper because you cannot find toilet paper. Right. If that's not proof of the contrast, but I, I just don't understand why people are so uneducated on the realities. Everybody knows what the Kardashians are doing, but what is your God and country doing? See, I was going to ask you about that. How much does the media or the news world journalism play? Because, I mean, today I wake up and, and, and now the big story is, well, there must be something wrong with the way Putin is thinking. He's mentally uh, uh, unstable. And it's like, wait a second. This is what we're going to blame it on now? <laughs> yeah, no, you, you're spot on with that one. And that, that's, that's ironic. I mean, you know, again, Putin has been Putin since day <laughs> one. He was a senior KGB officer. He is the quintessential, you know, Russian male uh, alter ego, um, and their system is based on expansionism and control. Anybody who's surprised about the the, the expansionist ideas of of China and the expansion, you know, uh, of, of Russia, is is living is living a fantasy. You know, uh, e- even Britain had to give up their 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 kingdoms and their their wide world yes. controls. Uh, and as, as countries become, became democracies, um, you'll never see that changing in, 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 uh, in communist ideology. England will never go back and attack Hong Kong to take uh, possession of Hong Kong again. The Russians will keep coming back. Anybody who's surprised that Putin is trying to rebuild the Soviet Union to his glory, for lack of a better word, is, is, is just fooling themselves. That's playing ostrich. How do you keep your cool behind enemy lines? Because as a third degree, I, I, I sit here and th- there's a way that I can keep my cool, but I've never been behind enemy lines. You have. Well, you know, I, I think the real secret is, of course, there's training. And, and like I said, I've been in the martial arts since I was a kid. I still practice, even mm-hmm. though I was 71. But I think it's the purpose. Um, if you believe in what you're doing, you really believe in what you're doing, Um the courage is there, and I think God puts that in your heart. Um, you have to believe, you have to have a purpose, and I learned that fairly early in life, the difference between being a, an adventurous jerk and being adventurous for the right reasons. Do you think as a martial artist, and this is where people I drive people crazy, is one of the things, I can see somebody 100 feet away and almost predict every step they're going to take, only because the body is the language. Absolutely. For us, you know, there, there's uh, several examples in, in the book of uh, what I call awareness beating fast draw. Um, and in our world, it's called tradecraft and is being aware of your surroundings, mm-hmm. having plans for what if and, and not be like most people are. They go into a restaurant, they sit anywhere. You know, it, it's funny. Me, me and my, even my kids, when they, were, when they were little, we would walk into a restaurant they knew where dad was going to sit. <laughs> and they knew that I knew where the, the, the back exit was or where the bathroom was and, and, and everything else. So in, in ours, it's, it's a game of reading the cards. It's like, like poker. I mean, you know, you, you, it's not the cards that you're dealt. It's who your player is across the table. So I, I commend you. When you see somebody 100 yards down and they have a certain swagger or a certain demeanor, 
um, you need to be aware of that and be prepared to defend yourself or, or hopefully just avoid. But you can't avoid it if you're surprised. And with you traveling into other nations and things like that, how do you not put bias in front of anything? Because, I mean, what looks like it must smell like it must be. I mean, because you can't do that because you can't judge a book by its cover. No, you can't. And as a matter of fact, that's a, that's a great observation. You know, one of the reasons that one of the hiring criteria is for the agency is world uh, experience, mm -hmm. you know, having, even when our, we get young college kids who are super brilliant, we'll let them go into the private sector for a few years and, 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 and go overseas and, and, and work or whatever, uh, just to gain that, um, learning a culture, appreciating a culture, respecting a culture, you know, you can't expect everybody to think the same and worship the same, but you can demand that people act like human beings and civil to each other. Um, so yeah, a lot of people will go in and uh, you know and, and demean the uh, the people of a country or look down on them. Um, you would not you would not be uh, successful in the agency or in the State Department if, if you were not respectful of other cultures and and uh, and other ways of doing things. Because you've always been so I don't want to say secretive, but you've you've held things in because your experience requires you to do that. I'm a daily writer. I've been doing it for 28 years. I put all my junk in 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 journals. How the hell did you keep this everything going a big secret until Black Ops? And what does it feel like now that it's out of you? Probably the scariest thing I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, yeah, you know it's funny because uh, my kids and my wife will be very surprised when they read the book. Now there's two little uh, ep uh, episodes or vignettes uh, where my wife actually did get involved in some moderate but still adventurous stuff in support of, of God and country. But my kids were always telling us, Dad, you, you never talk about, we don't know what you did. You need to write that stuff down. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but but I, I'll be honest with you, the, the word author was never uh, imagined in my title. Um, but again, I believe in courage if you have a purpose, and I do have a purpose, and the purpose of my book is to let people understand what the CIA really is and what the real CIA operations officers and our colleagues in the, the Director of Intelligence and Support and Security, you know, we're patriots trying to do God's work in a very ungrateful mistress. How invisible was Bin Laden? Because in, in talking with you and, and, and reading the book, Black Ops, it's almost like we always knew where he was. We just had to find the right time. Actually, we always knew what we had, uh, where he was, what he was doing. And we had the plans, viable plans in place to disrupt him or kidnap him or whatever the hell we wanted to do. What we lacked was the political fortitude to do it at the time. And uh, it, it, it's a shame because it's the same analogy if you could go in a time machine and, and put a bullet in, in, in uh, Hitler's head in 1939, um, what do you think the world would be like? Right. And the same thing could be said about bin Laden. When bin Laden was in Khartoum in the, in, in the mid nineties, we had him bracketed. We knew everything about him. We had my personal friend, Billy Wall literally had photographs, surveilled his place, had a, a, an observation post that he could see his place from. We knew the size of his detail the capabilities, there were a bunch of clowns. We could have taken a team of 20 special operations guys in there and grabbed his ass, pulled it out, <laughs> and, and whoever got in their way would get killed. Imagine if we would have done that. You're talking the coal, you're talking the embassy bombings in, 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 in Africa, mm -hmm. you're talking 9-11. None of those things would most likely have happened if we would have had the political fortitude to, like we say, Cry havoc and unleash your dogs of war. Real person question. So when you when you when you're traveling the world as a CIA agent and you see somebody that you know, somehow, some way you got to acknowledge that you know them, or do you? It depends who it is. If it's another colleague, there, there's a rule that unless you make eye contact and smile kind of thing, you, you never approach another colleague at an airport somewhere. Wow. Uh, and, and actually, well, my, my deputy, there's several stories about him in the book. Uh, was in, in an airport in Germany uh, and Transy, and this is later in my career, and he sees me and I see him, he's my best friend. Mm. He's one of my best friends. And we kind of look at each other and totally ignore each other. Uh, that said, what if it's a foreign national that you've met somewhere before? Um, 
then I, my style is to approach them and ask them to be discreet. Yep. Uh, I've had a relationship with, let's say, a Costa Rican or, 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 or Brazilian or whatever, and now I bump into this individual in a, in a different theater, um, and, I, and he has had some kind of a professional association with me. I have no problems with approaching him and reintroducing myself and saying, by the way, I am an underwater basket weaver now. <laughs> Please allow that. And uh, and most of the most of the people would get it. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's part of the excitement, you know. And, and it is it's those what we call oh damn it moments <laughs> when things you're not expecting all, all of a sudden happen, and it's happened to all of us. You know, being in the middle of nowhere and there's somebody that. Hey, aren't you so and so? Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, I'm so proud of you for putting this book together because my father served our nation in World War II, and he never shared his story with us. And that's why I read books like Black Ops because through you, I I think I might see who my father was. That's that's very kind of you, and and you know, you guys have a very tough job, and we, I really appreciate the efforts that you do uh, to, that you make to educate the populace and, and uh, I really appreciate that and I pre- appreciate your support for Black Ops thank you so much please come back to this show anytime in the future the door is always going to be open for, you, open for you Rick it'll be my pleasure thank you very much be brilliant today same take care bye guy because, because Arrow's brilliant yeah <laughs> of course. Of course. Of course. Michael. <laughs> I love your photo